Hey, Cap City, this is Pastor Rick, and I'm here with my friend Amanda Willie. Amanda and her family are fairly new to our Cap City family. And I've asked Amanda to spend some time with me this morning, with us this morning, because we're going to be talking about one of the don't commands where Jesus said, don't judge. Now, Amanda is not a judge, but you may wonder what she does. And Amanda, you are an attorney. I am. What do you do? I'm a research analyst for the Republican House Caucus, so I work at the State Capitol Building, and I make complicated legal issues easy to understand for the general public mm -hmm. and for elected officials. Um, I have 64 bosses. Wow. So, you know, a little bit of a unique experience. And I cover all things judiciary and public safety. Mm -hmm. So guns, drugs, troopers, prisons, courts, any policy, budget, bill, question uh, that any of those 64 House Republicans have, I am their resident expert on those issues. So you make really complicated things easy for people who don't understand. I try. <laughs> Very good. You know, I've been thinking about becoming a lawyer myself. Um, I watched this show on Netflix that said that if you have a really good computer hacker that they can give you a, a degree from Harvard Law, you don't even have to go to law school. It's called Suits. Have you ever seen that? Just a few times, yeah, yes. Think, and you know work? what? It, you might be better than some of the lawyers out there. <laughs> I just, hope not. Just try it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just try it, right? I find myself on the wrong end of the judicial system. And so Jesus says, don't judge. Now, one of the biggest complaints people have about Christians is that we're judgmental. And I think, in, in fact, it's probably true, uh, at least in some cases. And I think there are a couple reasons why Christians uh, tend to be judgmental. One, I think sometimes, and it's hard to admit, but I think we're jealous. I think sometimes Christians look at other people who are sinning and they're having fun and we get a little resentful. We get jealous they're having more fun than we are. We don't really understand sin and don't really understand righteousness. I think maybe the, the other reason, the second reason, is that we're just self-righteous. We just view ourselves better than other people. And it, as much as we shouldn't, uh, we have a tendency to put them down, to put them in a box, to label them. Um, now, it's a lot different, I think, what we're talking about today than, than perhaps the judicial system. But what do judges do? What is their job? So the judge's job is to ensure that justice is administered fairly. Mm -hmm. whether that's for the plaintiff or the prosecution or the defendant. Um, there are a special set of rules when you enter a courtroom that don't exist anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And the judge's responsibility is to make sure that those rules are followed mm -hmm. um, and that everybody receives the fair trial that they are constitutionally um, uh, required to have. Okay. And so a judge would use uh, at least a couple of things to make his rulings, right? One would be mm -hmm. just the simple law, right? The books that you read, the laws that have been recorded over time. What else would they look at? Uh, the judge will also look at case law. So mm -hmm. previous rulings will set the standard for how that judge has to rule. Okay. Um, the judge may also look at some background of the defendant if it's a criminal trial. Um, that background could include previous convictions, mm -hmm. uh, what led the defendant to commit the crime, yes. um, any other outside things like that assuming that they are allowed in under the rules of the court. That's fascinating to me because many times when we feel judged, and all of us have probably felt judged by other people, um, we want uh, people to see the context behind our behavior, how we grew up, the obstacles we've overcome, the kind of day we had, how our kids behave, whatever it would be, yeah. right? We want them to judge us on the curb with grace. Um, but sometimes when we see other people, we just make very snap judgments based on a just a, a mental snapshot in time, not taking into effect or account any of the context reasons people may be the way they are. Uh, and so judges uh, try to make sure that the law is carried out fairly. And then you either have a plaintiff or a defendant or somebody that's sort of on the low end of the totem pole in the system, and you have lawyers. And now, mm -hmm. what is a lawyer's job? A lawyer's job is to kind of bridge the gap between the either the plaintiff or the defendant and the judge, okay. um, because we have a very special language in the legal community that mm -hmm. the general public isn't supposed to understand. And so the lawyer is that intermediary. Okay. Uh, if we're talking a criminal defense trial, mm -hmm. the lawyer is there to be sure that the right evidence is presented, that all the rules are followed, that the defendant is judged fairly, mm -hmm. whether it's by the judge or by um, a jury of their peers. Right. But that's the attorney's job is to be the advocate for their client, whatever that issue is. Right. And so for a person, uh, if they were being accused of a crime for example, and uh, uh, chose not to uh, to hire a defense attorney, but to represent themselves, uh, that's usually not a good idea, right? Uh, no, no. Uh, as a lawyer, I have to tell you, that is one of the worst ideas I think a person could have. Um, even a lawyer who gets arrested normally hires another lawyer to right. represent themselves, because you will never 
advocate for yourself as well in those situations as a, another attorney can. Somebody else would. Yeah, so Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, when he talked to us about not judging, when he says, don't judge, um, I believe that um, he had come to sort of change the rules. The Old Testament was very black and white, very clear. Uh, there was a law and there was a law that God had, mediated or enforced very strictly. Uh, the Old Testament sacrificial system, all the festivals people had to keep. There wasn't a lot of wiggle room, not a lot of tolerance. Uh, people had to toe the line. And then Jesus came and in a sense, he said to God the Father, you judge me um, for the sins of all the people. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna pay that price so that we don't have to judge each other, that we can pass on the love and the grace that Jesus gave us. And so in a sense, Jesus is like a good defense attorney, I would think, mm -hmm. standing in the, the gap between us and between the judge your God the Father. Mm -hmm. uh, so for you, what's your favorite part about your job? Uh, the, my favorite part about my job is getting people to understand why a law exists or how it exists mm -hmm. and what it can do for them um, and being able to help people. I know everybody cringes when I say I work in politics and I'm a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes people really nervous. But there are so many good things that come out of that. So many people that I can help who say, hey, you know, here's the problem. Mm -hmm. I can go to the code section, show them the solution. And if there's no law that mm -hmm. has a solution to their problem, sometimes the representatives can write one. Right. Um, and we can write them for small things and big things and the change that that makes on an individual level is probably the most fulfilling thing for me. Right. I'm really grateful that you are doing that job and that you're helping us. I live in the state and appreciate all the work that you guys do. Uh, and I was just kidding. I'm not going to go to <laughs> act like I went to Harvard Law. I'm going to stick to what I do. You stick to what you do, okay? I think that's a really good plan. <laughs> thank you for being here today. I, I appreciate it, Amanda. Absolutely. Thank you. Fascinating that inside a courtroom that the judge has to render judgment based on just the information presented to him or her um, in light of the law and uh, that's it. And they have to decide the fate of a person's life or a company perhaps or the financial future of a person or the state of a relationship. And oftentimes we judge, which by the way, the definition of judge is to size someone up and to dismiss them or to write them off. Oftentimes we judge with uh, in sort of the same way, but not even nearly as fairly. We just take a snapshot, a picture of someone's life. We determine in our own minds what the circumstances are. We size them up, we label them, and we dismiss them or write them off. Jesus said, don't judge. In fact, let's read the first part of this passage again together. Do not judge or you too will be judged, for in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now we're gonna talk about the fact that not only are we not supposed to prematurely judge, but that we are in fact, as we work through a process that Jesus unfolds here in Matthew chapter seven, supposed to see the people in our lives, to view the things in their lives that may be holding them back or hindering them, to take careful consideration about our own life, to examine our own heart, and then to be involved with the people around us as brothers and sisters in Christ. But let's build this case together. Now, you know, we talk about this passage from time to time, and I love talking about the same passage um, two or three times because I like to focus on different parts of the passage, and it's impossible to do uh, one passage that's as powerful and as full as this passage in, at the end of Jesus' great sermon and do it justice in 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. And so today we're gonna to be talking about a whole different aspect, but yet equally as important, almost the conclusion of what we began together back in July. Now, to judge somebody, very simple, the definition we're gonna use is to size somebody up and to write them off. Not too terribly long ago, uh, just two weeks as a matter of fact, I was walking in uh, our neighborhood and I found out that I do judge people. And you know, I like to think of myself as being non-judgmental, which might be a, a sort of um, a warning sign in and of itself. All of us have a tendency to be a little judgmental or self-righteous, but I think I judge people like when I walk through our neighborhood, I judge them by their garage. Isn't that weird? Like if their garage is open and it's a mess, I'm like, oh, I think their life just must be totally out of control. And, and I, I form all these conclusions because I've worked on my garage recently and it's tip top. And so I've worked on areas in my life where I have a show garage. I had a friend who came over and, and did my floor in my garage and painted it for me. And it looks fantastic. So I've worked and made that an area of strength. So it's easy for me to judge other people if it's an area of their weakness. And for some reason, when I walk, it makes me feel better about myself. Oh, my life must be better than theirs because their garage is a mess and mine is clean. How dumb is that? But we do things like that 
all the time. So I'm walking down the alley. We have alleys in Prairie Trail and I'm listening to my sermon. I always listen to sermons. I don't listen to music when I walk, not because I'm spiritual. I just like to, to listen to sermons more than music. It's just the way I'm wired. I just love listening to the spoken word. I'm listening to a pastor preach on this passage. Now I'm listening to it in a way um, that was a little annoying to my neighbors because my wife was out of town and she took my headphones, my Apple earbuds or whatever they are. And so uh, I had no way to um, keep my message private. I had to listen to it in speakerphone. So I'm walking down the alley, have my phone stuck in my pocket and uh, I have the speakerphone on and it's a preacher preaching on being judgmental. Neighbors are outside, you know, getting pieces, bits and pieces of the message. And I'm sure it was a, a little bit obnoxious or annoying, but I was walking down the alley and there was a guy working construction who was walking the same direction that I was. And he was heading to a Kaibo. Uh, I was heading uh, not to the Kaibo, but just down the, the alley. And I'm listening and, and on the speakerphone, it says to judge somebody is to size them up and write them off. And I thought I heard, he was behind me. I thought I heard somebody go, yup. And, um, I kept walking and the preacher said it again, to size somebody up and to write them off. That's to judge them. And, and I heard, I'm almost certain, yep. And so the third time the preacher said it, he goes, to judge somebody is to size them up and write them off. I turned and look at the guy and he goes, yep. And we made eye contact and we had a moment because he obviously knew what it was like to be judged. Have you ever felt sized up and written off by somebody? Have you ever felt like they just looked at you in your life didn't understand the context, didn't give you the benefit of the doubt, just decided what was true and wasn't true and sized you up and wrote you off. Christians do it all the time. And I wish we didn't. It's something that happens, unfortunately, if we're not careful, the longer a person's a Christian, the longer we're in church, it's harder and harder to walk with Jesus and to have a relationship with him in humility and brokenness and dependence and to show the ones around us that we have that same dependence and humility, but easier and easier to, to establish a subculture that looks very Christian, where we start dressing a certain way and using certain words and we say, brother this and amen that, and we can pray in the King James and, and we think we're becoming more holy, but everyone around us just knows we're becoming a little more weird and, and we get just, there's just something if we're not careful. And I think there's two reasons that we judge. And I mentioned it in the video. And the first one is, I think that maybe we're jealous of people when they sin. There's a pastor named Craig Rochelle. And he said that if um, you're not having fun with you, when you sin, you're doing it wrong. And I thought that was kind of funny because um, sin for a season is fun. But yet sometimes Christians get so angry at other people who seem to be having more fun than we are because we don't truly understand sin and we think they're getting away with it. And so it makes us a little snarky a little judgmental. We want to write them up, size them up, put them in a box and dismiss them. But if we really understood sin and the brokenness that comes from sin and the fact that when we live in sin continually, things die, our attitude would be totally different. Well, the second reason I think that we get very judgmental is that we Christians are often self-righteous. Now this is the context that Jesus was really um, communicating this message within to people, Pharisees in particular, who had made religion all about themselves, who thought that they were better than everyone else, who felt like that even though they'd probably done some bad things in their life, that the good things that they'd done far outweighed the bad and they were okay. And they love to be able to show everybody else why you weren't. If I constantly held my life up to you and said, look at my garage, it's so clean. When I knew that you didn't have a clean garage, but there's no chance I would let you in to see my kitchen or my bathroom or my basement or whatever, because it wasn't my strength at the moment, but yet easier to hide. It's easy for me to keep things superficial, to grade myself against you, you against other people. We become very, very self-righteous. And there are a few things about being self-righteous that I think we need to consider. The first is self-righteousness is caused by ignorance. We don't really understand who we are. We don't really understand the effect of sin. And we don't really understand the fact that Jesus had to die for our sins. 
and that he stands as the great defense attorney between us and God the Father, us being guilty and deserving punishment, and not only defends us, but took the sentence for us so that we didn't have to. And in our ignorance and our arrogance, we become judgmental. The second thing is that self-righteous people underestimate God's holiness and overestimate their own. God, you sit this one out. Sometimes I know you can be a little grace-filled and a little merciful. And in this situation, God, you may not know everything that I know, but I think we need to apply some justice and vengeance here. So you have a seat, God. I'm gonna take care of this. I'm gonna judge. I'm gonna criticize. I'm going to label. I'm gonna be self-righteous. And if you read the gospels, friends, Matthew, Mark, and Luke particularly, when Jesus addresses self-righteousness, he does it in a way, track with me here and give me a little bit of patience and understanding. When Jesus addresses self-righteousness in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you wonder if Jesus is even a Christian himself because a switch is flipped and he goes off and he takes no prisoners. And he does his best to protect everyone else from the self-righteous, judgmental, religious elite and tells the religious elite, the judgmental and self-righteous that it's better for them to tie a huge stone to their neck and throw themselves in a lake than it is for them to get in the way of somebody really finding a right relationship with him. He takes it so, so seriously. Number three, self-righteous people are judgmental, which we've established, but also critical. There's something in us this sinful part of us that remains that just makes us critical. Now, do you know somebody that's just critical? That's just critical, 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 critical. You're around them and what do they do? They criticize, maybe not you, because that would at least have some integrity face to face, but everyone else. And if you wanna be really honest, have you ever found yourself slipping into a spirit of criticism where you find yourself criticizing the people around you and maybe you by yourself or maybe you with a spouse or a friend, that sinful, judgmental, self-righteous spirit that we hate begins to creep in and take over and we start having people for lunch. And then we stop because the Holy Spirit within us tells us to stop and say, we can't tear down. We have to build up. But self-righteous people, they traffic in criticism and judgment because they think they're right. And being right is a whole lot more important than anything else. Are you kind of getting the idea why it bothers Jesus so much? Now, before you say, yeah, all those critical, judgmental, self-righteous people out there need to change, walk with me a while because I think you'll see a reflection of yourself in here somewhere. I know I have. So just stick around. Um, number four, self-righteousness, critical spirits and a judgmental sort of attitude. And as you'll see in a minute, self-righteous people are almost always not self-aware. They would never say they're self-righteous. You know, you probably talk about them, but not to them. But self-righteous people are very rarely self-aware. Self-righteousness often leads to family and friends limiting or cutting off communication. Most cases, because you have been more concerned about being right and driving things that may be true into a person with whom you don't have the relationship to drive that truth into and you drive them away. And we say it's because we're so holy and separate and different and that they just can't handle being around somebody who lives the truth. But in reality, they don't want to be around somebody who refuses to live in love. And it starts a long time before you come to an exchange or interchange like this. 
I'm trying to figure out how to parent adult children. I'll take any tips that any of you guys have to offer. It's a weird new phase for my wife and I. We're empty nesters. There's some of you guys here that are new empty nesters. It's strange. I don't think Joy um, has these same feelings. I think she's kind of got her head around it better than me because she adjusts faster. But sometimes I'll wake up in the morning and it's like, I still sort of think they're there and they're not there. They've been gone a long time. They're 25 and 28 years old. And I, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to be a dad. I want so bad for my boys to walk in a right relationship with God. And I was talking to some really good friends the other day at dinner in the same exact situation. And we were talking about our goals for parenting. And what we said is we want to be in a spot where our kids want to have a relationship with us and be friends with us long after they have to. And it starts while they have to. Because it's only through that kind of relationship do we have the ability to be able to coach, to encourage, to nudge, and to love. But sometimes self-righteous people have been so concerned about truth without being concerned about love and grace and relationship, which are not microwaved, by the way. They're baked, and it takes a long, long time that we find that we've lost the influence and not being self-aware, we wonder why. So we wanna prevent that at all cost. Sometimes we wonder why the people around us don't really wanna talk to us. They wanna tell us when they have a victory, but never wanna share anything with us when they struggle or have a defeat. Perhaps we have something to look at to examine our hearts and to see if Jesus might be talking about us. Well, self-righteous people are often not self-aware. And one of the goals that Jesus had for us in this passage is for us to become self-aware so that we can partner with him in his redemptive plan. Many times they're isolated in relationship and don't really have anybody in their life who can really speak truth to them. That they're around people but don't really know anyone. And the scary thing is that often people like this are very prepared to cut you out of their lives if you get too close and you begin to suggest things that make them uncomfortable. Self-righteous people often present as loners, experts, or run in small groups of like-minded people, usually very small. And unfortunately, sometimes you see this in church and you have for years and years and years and years and nobody really ever says anything about it. Instinctively, you just know something's wrong. Something's not right. Everything looks on the surface great. It looks so spiritual. And everybody's praying for everybody or at least saying they're going to and calling them brother and using the King James and dressed up and given their money, but yet you just know something's wrong and you're not 100% sure what it is. Well, Jesus did not tolerate self-righteousness. And if you stick around, and I hope you will, after we sing a few songs, we're gonna come back and we're gonna look at what this might look like in our lives. And then what you and I are supposed to do in this three-step process that Jesus communicates on us living in community with each other. I'm gonna give you a hint. The first one is that we look into the lives of those around us who have a relationship with us, who we've invested the time in, to connect with, where we have influence. That we look deeply within our own lives and make sure that the things in us that don't need to be aren't there any longer, and that we're willing to come alongside in relationship and community and to perhaps point out things that may be blind spots in someone else, to care enough and to love enough to get involved and to engage. And Jesus lays it out in a way that's so clear, but so life-changing that I know we're gonna live differently after we figure it out together in just a few minutes. 
I'm gonna have a few friends down here in the front during our worship, during our singing. If any of you have anything you wanna pray about, anything you're a burden perhaps or request, something that you're dealing with in your own life, maybe the life of somebody else, Perhaps it's a family situation, maybe it's finances, could be health, goodness knows. We have so many struggling physically in our church family right now. We'll be down here in the front. You're welcome to come and, and to pray with us if you want to. You can fill out the, the cards in the seat back in front of you and, and write your request on there. You can hand it to one of us or put it in the box on the wall on your way out. And we have a prayer team who will meet during the week and they'll pray for your requests. They'll follow up with you if you want them to. But let's take these next few minutes and let's pray together, let's sing together, and then we'll come back and we'll apply this truth together as we figure out the rest of this passage and what it is Jesus is really trying to say. So especially in light of what we talked about last week with the fact that, who knows, perhaps we could be entering the end times. Perhaps not, but perhaps, right? It got us all thinking, which is important for us to be thinking, that um, if the final events of the world as we know it are coming to an end, what are we doing about it? are we part of the problem or part of the solution? Are we partnering with Jesus or are we just sitting around waiting for somebody else to do it? And the reason that Jesus left this gospel with us, with people, isn't so that we could live separate and apart from the rest of the world, just assuming that they're going to catch how holy we are by observations made through a telescope that to love somebody might mean we have to be with somebody and for somebody. And maybe we don't have to worry about becoming like somebody just because we like somebody. But the self-righteous prefer to isolate, prefer to size up and dismiss because it's easier. But aren't you glad Jesus didn't do that because he in heaven before he came to earth as a, as a boy, a baby, and grew up into a man, a perfect man, 100% God, 100% man, and died on the cross for our sins and paid the price we couldn't pay. Aren't you glad he didn't say, you know, I just don't want to be associated with these people. I think it might make me look bad. Their issues are just a little too much for me to deal with. He was never scandalized by proximity. He expected people to have issues in their life and to have sin that burdened and made us harassed and helpless. And so because Jesus lived that way, he expects us to live that way, but there's a pull within us as, as we become Christians and become less Christ-like and more churchy to move away from Jesus' example. And so this reminder is as relevant today as it was when Jesus gave it, when Jesus says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say, let me worry about you before I worry about me? Now there's some commas in here and some periods and it's really important. Jesus doesn't assume that there's not a speck in your eye. He just wants to make sure that I assume and know that there's a plank in mine and the plank that he was talking about is self-righteousness. My desire to be judgmental and critical to size you up and dismiss you. And he said, listen, before you worry about somebody else, worry about yourself. Examine your heart and confess your sin. And then he says, after you've done that, then you're ready to be in relationship with another brother or sister because you've humbled yourself. You're becoming a man or a woman, strong man, a strong woman with soft and compassionate hearts, who are for people, not against them, who are with the world and not afraid of becoming like the world, who aren't trying to isolate ourselves and show from a distance how holy we are, but are willing to live like Jesus and mix it up with people Jesus came to die for because he loved them. So he says, examine yourself. And then after you examine yourself, you'll be ready to be in relationship with someone else. And if you don't, by the way, he calls us hypocrites. Let's move on with this. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brothers. 
Jesus defined hypocrite this way, if you wonder. This is what Jesus means when he says hypocrite. He says, someone who's more interested in other people's flaws than they're interested in their own. Somebody who's interested or more interested in other people's flaws than they are interested in their own. But there's a process and it involves three parts. Jesus doesn't say, don't determine truth from error. He doesn't say when you see something in someone else's life who's close to you, who you've invested in, who you have relationship with, who you've earned some trust with, who wants to hear from you and be around you when you see something in them that's dangerous or damaging with love and humility and compassion, you come and you share after you've taken care of your own business because the kingdom becomes better. Our hearts become softer. The world can see more clearly. And he says, if you're just more concerned about everybody else's issues than your own, you're a hypocrite and you're useless to me. And if you don't believe he uses that strong language, read the incidents in Matthew and Mark and Luke where he talks to the self-righteous. In your notes, I've included a passage of scripture, a parable Jesus told about a tax collector and a Pharisee that went into the temple to pray. And not only is it revealing, but illustrates this point perfectly. But we don't have time for that. I wanna talk to you about the three different audiences that heard this and what it is that we're supposed to do because this is what's really important. This is what we have to walk away with. The first uh, person who might've heard this, maybe perhaps you are one of these people, uh, I'm certainly not judging or being critical, just throwing the options out there. The first person is the person who sees somebody else. They size them up and they dismiss them. That's it. You're different than me, I don't like you. It can be political, It can be economic, it can be life choices, it can be where you happen to live, it can be the religion you happen to be a part of. I mean, maybe they just don't like you because of your face, I don't know. There are all kinds of reasons why people decide they don't like somebody. But you just look at the world as your kind of people and everybody else. And you prefer to size everyone up and write them off. And essentially you say, if you don't agree with me, then leave me. These are people who may be happy that there's a hell. Do you know what I'm talking about? Let me step out from under the tanning lamps and see your faces. You ever met anybody who you think is just happy that there's a hell? Because they know some people who need to go there. It's not them, but they just know people who deserve it. And they just seem a little happy that they're heading there. That scares me to death. I believe wholeheartedly there is a hell and I believe the Bible teaches that, but I absolutely hate that and wish with all my heart it wasn't true because I deserve to go there as much as anyone else. And the only reason I'm not is because Jesus saved me because of my faith in his grace and he gave me a free gift of eternal life. What business of it is mine to decide who deserves to go to hell? That's the first category. And if we fall into that category, we need to do one thing, two syllable word, repent, because it makes Jesus really, really angry. And we don't wanna be in that position, but it's so easy, so easy to slip. Number two, those who size someone up and dismiss them or ignore them, Um, and don't engage. So it takes the first audience and sort of expands it a little. I look at your issues and I don't hate you. Um, I don't, you know, put you in a category and just walk away. But I put you in a category and I use you as an example to learn from. I don't wanna be like that person. They've ruined their life. Maybe I tell my kids about that person. Hey, do you see such and such? You don't want to end up like them because, you know, they've really messed up. Maybe you put them on a prayer list. Maybe you talk about them, but just not to them. And of course, we see the sin, we see the issues, we see the damage, and we want to learn from it. And that's noble, but we yet don't want to get involved, which is the opposite of love. 20 years ago, somebody did something to me that made me mad, and I'm still mad at them. I don't know if I've forgiven them or not. I'll have to check my heart the dark places and find out. I was preaching 
And I had a seminary student who came to church and visited. Now, I've been a seminary student a bunch of times, all right? So I can say this. You got good ones and you got bad ones. This was a bad one. Seminary students, they oftentimes think they know everything. They come into seminary thinking they know everything. They go there for confirmation that they do. And if the right stuff doesn't happen, then they go out and pastor churches trying to convince everybody else that they do. And it gets really scary. Well, this kid was visiting. He was a seminary student after church. He came up and shook my hand. I said, man, I'm really glad to have you. We were talking and he said, hey, I got to tell you something. And I'm like, what? He goes, your breath really stinks. Uh, yeah, um, didn't know this kid. First time visiting. I'm like, hey, there's a good Presbyterian church up the street. Why don't you go there? Um, I was offended by his comment. And I was kind of stunned. I'm like, oh, you know, what do you do? And he goes, it's just my gift. He said, I just have a gift of telling people what they need to hear, even if they don't like it. His spiritual gift was being obnoxious, was offending people. I could have handled this three ways, right? He could have handled this three ways. He could have smelled my breath. And instead of saying, it smells like you've been drinking coffee for three days, he could have walked away sized me up and dismissed me, deciding that that church was the church with the pastor with the funky breath and he wasn't going to go back. Maybe even talking about my breath to other people, dismissing me, labeling me, walking away. Or number two, he could have walked away and thought, oh my goodness, I had coffee for breakfast too. I wonder if my breath smells as bad as the preacher's. And so he goes to the bathroom and brushes his teeth or pops a mint in, maybe even checks his kid's breath, his wife, honey, <laughs> you know, can, can you, and, and you know, you, you want to learn from it, but you wouldn't have tell somebody that their breath is bad, right? Here's the problem. The problem is I still had bad breath. Was it going to kill anybody? Maybe that day. I don't know how bad it was, but did I need to be told? Yes, I did. Just not by him. He didn't know me. He didn't love me. He hadn't invested any time in me. He thought it was his gift to be confrontational and my word obnoxious. But yet I still needed to be told. After a person noticed the problem, checked their own breath, the plank, perhaps the green thing in their teeth, maybe the hanger in their nose. Okay, I got everything squared away. How do I look, honey? Am I all right? Have I done the work I need to do? And then come to me put their arm around me, right? Hey, we're friends. This happens to everybody. Everyone has a funky breath day. This is your day, right? I mean, there are ways to say it that are a whole lot nicer than the way he said it. And that's number three, those who size someone up, who look into their own life and make the corrections that need to be made, who have the relationship, who come alongside uh, some, somebody and embrace them. And the people who don't, just don't really understand sin. Because sin that breaks our heart forces us to deal with it in our lives, but understanding how broken we are because of our sin in our lives compels me to be involved in your life because I love you and I don't want you to break like I have. Are you tracking with me? Do you, do you, do you follow where I'm, where I'm heading with this? And so Jesus says, you recognize and you don't walk away. You recognize and you walk away and you examine your own life. You make the corrections in your heart and then you come back and you embrace the brother or the sister and you make the correction because you're concerned about truth, but you have deposited so much love that the truth, even though it stings a little bit, can land. I want you to try this with me. And maybe you'll like it, maybe you won't. It doesn't matter. I did it. I didn't like it at first. It's growing on me. Um, can you say this? Just you nod your head if you can. If you can't, shake your head like that. I have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Can you say that? I can say it. I have sinned. My name's Rick. I'm a sinner. I've done things, thought things, said things, displeasing to God. I am a sinner. I have sinned. Now, let's take one step further. I do sin and fall short 
of God's standard. If you don't raise your hand, someone's going to judge you. <laughs> okay? I have sinned. I do sin. Even though I don't want to, I will sin and fall short of God's standard. And the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God comes through our defense attorney, our advocate, Jesus Christ, who stands between us and the judgment we have coming and defends us and serves our sentence. My sin is as bad as your sin. And your sin is as bad as the people who you hate. And the consequences may be different, but the consequences aren't up to you. They are up to God. And James 2.10 says, if you're guilty of one, the whole weight of the law falls upon you. So we humble ourselves instead of ranking ourselves in self-righteous, disgusting behavior. Now, finally, when Jesus says, when you look into, there's a phrase that he uses, very important. It's a turn of phrase. Let's look at this together. When you look into someone's life, let's advance to the next slide. When you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye, the when you look at and the pay no attention to it means literally to consider. In Luke, it's talking about to sit and stare at flowers in a field. In James, it's talking about gazing into your reflection. It's to look hard in your own life, to look with humility into your own life, to look with brokenness into your own life, to compare the life of Jesus to your own life if you're feeling a little too good about yourself and to realize that Jesus came to love and to serve a world, that you cannot love and serve if we alienate, label, judge, and ignore. That to be with somebody doesn't mean you're going to become like them, and to love them doesn't mean that you have to be influenced. If we're so worried that we're gonna be influenced, we have to grow, because Jesus said we have to go. Now, here's the phrase that I wanna to leave you to, or leave you with. Before I pass judgment on thee, it sounds very King James, but it works because it rhymes and preachers like that. Before I pass judgment on thee, I should stop and look for traces in me. Then I should go in love, in relationship, and accountability with the gift of self-awareness that comes from looking intently at my own issues and side by side with somebody, point out the things in them that may destroy them like my things have tried to destroy me. And that's how it's supposed to work. So when Jesus says, don't judge, this is what he means. And he summed up human relationships so masterfully in these five verses that if we do it, it will change your marriage, it will change your parenting, it will change your family, it will change where you work, it'll change our church, it will change our community, and it'll change our world. And Jesus said, it's the only way. Father, thank you so much for the time we've spent today. And I thank you for walking through this with me over these last two weeks and pointing out the things in me that are disgusting to you. The judgmental attitudes, the critical spirit, the things lurking in the dark spots that I didn't even know were there. And I pray that we would embrace this truth honestly, humbly, and allow it to break us 
from our self-righteousness, from our separatism, from our hatred. Because the time we live in, Father, demands that we shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, partner with you so that we can live in such a way where people see your strength even in our broken weakness. So give us that strength through your Holy Spirit to live according to your word, to be a light in a dark world until Jesus comes again. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.